white houses are exactly what they sound like. Homes, or slivers of ones, built by one party, often a sibling or former spouse, as a big middle finger to the other party. Then there are spite walls, which invariably involve very contentious neighbors. In New England, perhaps the granddaddy of spite walls can be found here in Westminster, Massachusetts. 11 feet high, that's a lot of stones and a lot of spite. Where the suburban homes stand today on North Common Road, Edmund Proctor farmed here in 1852. His closest neighbor, Farwell Morse, lived directly across the road and objected to the fact that Proctor, heavens, worked on Sundays, the Lord's Day, different times. From what I've read, this guy wanted to get this guy to stop working on Sundays because he didn't want to hear him cussing at his oxen while he was working the field. Steve Fredericks and his wife live in the former Farwell Morris house. So Steve, they definitely were close neighbors, right? So there wasn't much distance between them. No, there wasn't. So Proctor, determined to work and cuss whenever he damn well pleased, built a nearly 12 foot high wall between him and his neighbor. This is not your average stone wall in front of a house when you come by this thing. We get people that stop and um, we'll look at it and you know, I have seen people come out and take pictures. Proctor, who died in 1890, continued to add to the wall his entire life. There's no record of if or how his judgy neighbor responded. This was one guy who apparently did not subscribe to the old live and let live. No, no, not at all. Now to a more positive tradition. Ever hear of the Boston Post cane? The canes were made uh, of ebony. Very beautiful canes. In 1909, as a publicity stunt, the Boston Post newspaper began presenting a cane to the oldest resident of every New England city and town. The gold head is different for every town, like ours is presented by the town of Foxborough. Foxborough, Mass, remains one of those communities that still confers the cane on its oldest resident. Solid gold head? Absolutely. Has some nice heft to it. Yeah. No wonder you don't let them keep this anymore. That's right, we can value that. <laughs> yes, after the cane went missing some years back, the tradition was um, tweaked a bit. Today, when we present the cane, we hold it out and we let them touch it and hold it, but then we yank it back, then we keep it in safekeeping. This is what the recipient, the oldest resident, gets now. Yeah, we let them keep that. After all, it's the thought, not the cane, that counts. We've come across and visited some unique and under-the-radar museums in our travels. And here in Haverhill, Massachusetts, I found a fascinating whole new museum. Well, new to me. It's sort of the history of communication, and we emphasize the letterpress side of it. After spending his working life in the printing business, professor and author Frank Romano created the Museum of Printing in 1978. Over a million typographic pieces, every one donated, everything run by volunteers. A fascinating and detailed sweep of centuries of printing history. Frank, 1776? Yes, and you're holding that in your hand. George III King. That's right. Printed in England. This lasts because this is linen that is in the correct. paper. When people come in here, what kind of reactions do they have? Two, two reactions. One is nostalgia, and the other is amazement. Because they either worked with some of this technology, or they're just surprised that it even exists. Nostalgia, for sure. While many kids may no longer recognize these things, I was like a kid in a candy store. Still have a big soft spot for a classic typewriter. And while the exhibit does trace the path of printing from older to modern, it highlights the 1800s and the dramatic growth of printing. I even got a chance to help print something on the museum's oldest press, the 207-year-old Columbian. Give, give it a gentle pull till you can't pull it any farther. Keep going. Well, it's not quite the Gutenberg Bible, but... For Frank Romano, it's a love of the history, sure, but he also points out the enduring value of print. We are using print as people, because you can save print. It will be there 100 years from now. That digital file on your phone, I don't know where that will be 100 years from now. 
Alibaba, whether it's a faded newspaper, an old book, or a more modern digital device, Romano sees a one-word common thread. Type. It's the one thing that unites us all. The Museum of Printy Hands officially reopened every Saturday and Wednesdays by appointment, and they're planning a garage sale. Over the years, the museum has acquired more items than it can possibly display. So if you're in the market for a massive antique printing press, well, swing on by on August 29th. Up next, when it comes to politics, this collection is middle of the road.